can it work for you? Duty free, that's the question really we're asking today. In my experience, I wouldn't be here if it hadn't, uh, so clearly it can, but there's a lot of understanding along the way that I think hopefully will give you some of that as part of the industry. Is it important to the drinks category? What are the benefits and challenges of being in this business? And maybe some tips uh, from our experience of what maybe to do or what not to do with your bosses or family companies treasured money uh, in, order, in order to succeed. The channel is worth about $68 billion. Uh, the numbers I heard last week is 68, 69.6 uh, in 2017. So in many respects, that represents the business of a, a mid-sized European economy. And that channel is growing every year at a minimum of 5%. So find another market that's growing at that rate, if you can get into it, and you're guaranteed some degree of growth if you can find a sweet spot in terms of product, category, and consumer interest. Uh, our market touches over 1 billion people a year. Uh, apart from China, I don't think many other economies uh, or domestic markets will come into contact with a billion people a year. Now, not all those people are going to buy. Actually, most of them don't. Uh, but we have to understand why they don't, who they are, how you, how you access those people. Uh, it's a very interesting industry. Data is not what we're good at. There's very limited data availability because we travel across geography, geographical boundaries, and we don't have Nielsen data. We don't have a lot of domestic data that you might have here. So some of the headlines on business at the moment. Asia is booming. I think that's uh, not a surprise. China is on fire, uh, and other domestic markets in Asia are starting to go. Those folks are not traveling anywhere near the same rate that we do in Europe or America. When the Chinese and the Malaysians and the Indians travel at the rate that we do, you'll find your duty-free shops growing at a crazy rate. There are 30 international airports in China, bigger than most of the airports in Europe. And how much business do we have in those airports? Not much. So there is a scope for expansion, which is huge. If you look at the cruise business, those hotels on their sides, which float around the, float around the Caribbean or the Mediterranean, uh, again, Asia is becoming a rapidly growing market for cruise business. And ships are now locating out to Singapore and Hong Kong uh, and stocking themselves full of Asian-only uh, Asian food, Asian-only beverage. So if you have a beer that Asians like and you want to get on cruise ships, big opportunity. Um, the market is dominated by the in-airport retailers. So liquor represents about 15% of that 65, 68 billion. So something in the order of 15 to 20, 15 million dollars a year. Of that, 65% sits in airports. So the big, ugly airport stores that you see when you go through security. And that market, I'll come back to in a little bit more detail, is categorized and featured by a real polarization. The polarization of buying power, we're all used to that in domestic market economy. We see the same thing, international retailers, very greedy, very margin um, demanding, and also brand owners on the flip side who are, in I say, addicted they are pretty much locked in to long-term investments in airport retailing. Um, critically, we have to look at who's traveling and who would buy. If I, in the, in the gin category, for example, um, gin was not a big deal in duty-free up until maybe five years ago. Uh, do Chinese people drink gin? Because Chinese are the largest uh, body of travelers that are interesting and growing very quickly. Not yet, but will that happen? We have to make it happen. So you need to understand who's traveling and whether your product is going to work in the airport that you might target if you want to target a particular airport. Um, as I said at the start, it's susceptible but very resilient to the influences of geopolitics, uh, regulation and security. Uh, most of you, you know you can't pass through security with a bottle like this. You certainly can't take a bottle, of li a bottle of alcohol through security and if you're transferring on a flight from A to B to C, the rules change dramatically. So I've seen people having bottles of Louis XIII confiscated and thrown in a bin two and a half grand's worth of, uh, of cognac down the drain because they didn't understand the rules. We are security legislate, security heavy. The final point about most of our business is concession related. Uh, so if you've been working in a model in a, in a retailing environment where the concession fees are critical, you ain't seen nothing yet if you've come to duty free. Uh, the concession rates of the people, if I had money, I'd build an airport and lay, build a car park uh, because that's the way to generate money. And they ask for guaranteed income. They don't care about how many people actually turn up, how many people buy. They ask you, the retailer, for a guaranteed amount of money. And if that money doesn't emerge from the sales, it comes from us. 
Um, airport retailers seem to think that we brand owners have got bottomless pockets. Uh, I'm a family company. My pockets are a lot less than some of those uh, brand owners you might see outside here. Um, just a very quick nut few charts on data. Uh, as I say, Asia is the biggest region. If, these are all category sales, so it's not just liquor uh, and spirits. Asia accounts for over, almost half of the duty-free sales in the world and is, funnily enough, the fastest growing region. So if you want to know where to go and why, where to have a brand that could be interesting, then you look at Changi, you look at Hong Kong, you look at the airports in China. Don't worry too much about Paris or London. Yes, they're flagships, but the cost of entry into those places, you get your money back by trading in the East, in my experience. Uh, Africa, massive number of people, but a very small market. There are only, I think, five international airports that have got more than 10 million passengers a year in Africa. So the investment in space, if you want to buy space there, might not get a return. Um, I would say that America, the US, the Americas, um, lots of people. The concept of duty-free in the Americas has taken maybe longer to develop than it has in European. In Europe, we love the stuff. We can't get enough of the stuff. And whenever we go, we want to buy. Uh, we want to buy our favorite brands, but we also want to buy it cheap. So price becomes a heavy influencer on the market. If you look at where the segmentation is, as I said, airports account for the largest slug of the business. Um, airlines and ferries. Airlines is two sets of business. There's both what you drink on board and what you buy to take away. And on cruise ships, which is the fastest growing part of the tourism industry, uh, I think if I look at cruise capacity, I went, uh, John and I were at a cruise conference in Rome in the summer where they said they will continue to build mega ships, mega ships through to 2022, 23, and those ships have got a 20 year capacity. The cruise industry is not going to run out of steam for another, in terms of growth at least, for another 20, 25 years. For the spirits industry, um, when I look, segment the numbers, and I say the numbers are difficult to find, I look at IWSR data for this, so the International Wines and Spirits Register. Um, the duty-free retail is growing 10 times faster than most domestic markets, and it's all at the premium end. So what we try to do is to bring differentiation, premiumization, and products that can offer the retailer extra spend per head. They measure, most of them would measure our ability to, to influence their business by spend per head. So the number of people, the number of retail sales divided by the number of people wandering through their airports. We're a premium brand building environment that has both an on-trade and an off-trade element. On-trade being you can uh, buy on your cruise ship, you can buy in the air, and you can buy airside. In most cases, the airside part of the on-trade, the concessions, the bars in the airports, are nothing to do with our supply chain. They go through domestic market retail because they are, in many cases, duty, duty paid. The spirits industry is still considered a core part of the duty-free offer. So when you consider perfume and cosmetics, tobacco to a certain extent still, confectionery and liquor and tobacco, liquor and um, wines, wines and spirits, then we are still about 15%. In certain markets, in certain locations, we're higher. If you look at a place called Dubai, which is the largest in individual single location duty-free shop in the world, and there are about maybe 15 shops on that location, they're selling near enough $2 billion a year of duty-free goods. So one airport is selling near enough 5% of that 68 billion. Do I want to be in Dubai? Yes, of course I do. Uh, and we all have that ambition. Maybe getting there is slightly different um, challenge in terms of supply chain. Our share of global spirits market is very small. So it's less than 2%. In some companies, they will get up to maybe 15 to 20% of turnover. In other companies, it probably averages out about 5 to 8% of their global turnover will be in the duty-free market, everything being in order. And unfortunately, uh, for most of us, duty-free is the least profitable channel to be in. If I look at the P&Ls of the companies I've worked in before, certainly we were spurned on by the financial controllers at Diageo and Remy because every, every dollar they raised in revenue, they generated the least amount of profit. But from the flip side, we are, we're exposing the brands. So is it nice to have or is it an addiction? That's my question to any brand owner that I want to work with. And the question I asked Hayward when they employed me, do you really want to go for it? Because we need to make sure it's good. we are prepared to spend. Very quick in train to each of those channels. So airport retailing. Um, polarization is not something uncommon to most domestic markets. You have Walmart, you have Tesco, you have uh, Sainsbury, you have big groups controlling big international amounts of turnover at retail level. Most of you may not know the names on this chart. 
but you will walk through their shops when you go into an airport. Do Free, you might know, is world duty free. The UK, Spain, many small markets across uh, Latin America, Northern Europe, not so much in China and Asia as yet, but getting there. Um, Heinemann are based here uh, in Germany, uh, in Hamburg. They are probably the largest uh, and most spread retailer on the planet. They've got 55, 60 shops in Europe, but they distribute to third party uh, companies around the whole of the globe. DFS is an Asian customer with some in America. Lagardere is based in Paris. And then the largest growth opportunity will be the China Duty Free Group, uh, currently just in China, but spreading through joint ventures around the world. So it's increasingly difficult for small brands to have a relationship with those guys because they have a global buyer in a global head office that I cannot get into. When I joined Halewood, the door was locked because of the consolidation of a few other retailers in, in one group called Dufree. It took me two years to get an appointment just to present the statistics of the gin category, what was going on. Um, it takes time. So it's not a short, in this environment, it's not an easy to access short win. Some people maybe find a way for one airport. If you've got a local brand, it can work. And if you've got a brand that's on fire and you're lucky, great, but it can work. But what I'm saying is there is a, polarization is a big problem. What that means those retailers have is power. So they can charge you a lot of money to activate your brand on their space. So I think I'm quoting current rates. Uh, if you know Terminal 5 in Heathrow, uh, it's probably one of the largest liquor, liquor shops on the planet. They charge net probably about 150,000 a month to activate one brand for a month. All in all being rent, staff, sampling stock, decoration of the unit. I can't afford that. So how do small brands work together to maybe create uh, alliances or companies that work together. And there's a great example now in Europe called the Family Brand Alliance. I think they're up to five brands now that work together. Um, and they, they offer a supply chain and logistics support, but it's down to the individual brand to do the marketing. Um, pricing has always been a critical thing in duty free. So one of the big motivations for shoppers in the channel is price. I want to buy it cheaper than the supermarket. I, will need, I think I should buy it cheaper in the airport. And if it's not, if I can't buy my favorite Johnny Walker cheaper in the airport, then nothing in the airport is going to be cheap because they believe that everything in the airport is, is, is valued by the price at which they buy their known brands. The other flips, the other thing at the moment is we've all got mobile phones and the further east you go, the price comparison sites, they're in the duty free shop, they're everywhere. So pricing is a critical aspect. And with most concessionaires wanting a minimum of a 20% saving versus the domestic market, then again, it's digging into your pocket. Um, how do we make that different? Um, we try to bring some exclusive products to the market. So we have a litre bottle for most of our customers. Most of markets operate on 750 in the US or 700s here. In my business, I try to say we don't sell litres to anyone other than duty-free operators. Therefore, I have exclusivity over that pack size. I can control the pricing and the supply chain. On brown spirits, you start to find a lot of non-age spirits coming into the duty-free channel. So in my day in Diageo, we introduced black, uh, double black. In my days in Remy, we introduced the seller master range and took the traditional qualities out. Do the consumers like it? Do they not? It depends on the brand, but it can be a challenge when you offer an experienced malt buyer something that's got no age statement on it. And that's down to the global dynamics of, of whiskey and cognac and malt. Um, and lead times for entering this channel uh, can take over a year. So it's not an instant win. And we, we had to submit, if we work with Heinemann, a process on pricing and brand selection for, was it May 19 to April 20, in the middle of August this year. So do I control the exchange rates? Do I control my cost of goods? Can I control all that a year away? But I have to commit to the price. <coughs> Airlines, so they're only small, they're 2%. Airlines, basically, you have your big national flag carriers versus your low-cost operators, low-cost carriers, and each of those operate a different dynamic. So your full-service flag carriers, your, your British Airways, your Lufthansa, your Air France, will have a different dynamic and a different motivation to what you see on the low-cost carriers. The low -cost, for low-cost carriers, duty-free is a revenue stream that makes them money. They don't make money on tickets. They make money on everything else they can charge you for. So if they could charge you for a, a, a seatbelt, they charge you for a seatbelt. Um, I think Ryanair might be thinking about it at the moment, but in, at the moment they don't. I did see a cartoon a few years ago which basically looked like the inside of a London tube train uh, with just hanging, hanging uh, hangers for people to hang on to, and that was the Ryanair of the future. Um, 
the low-cost carrier model is basically saying, if you want to drink on board or buy a sandwich on board to consume on board, you pay on-trade pricing or more. They will do some deals, but you have to buy a ticket for the lottery or whatever it might be along the way. If you want to buy a duty-free product to take away, we're only going to provide a minimum basic range. There's not much interest in the, in the, uh, in the um, catalogues. I show a couple of examples where, for, for me, it's been an interesting development over the last year because the retailers in the sky have got you sitting there. They want you to develop a premium interest. So they understand about premium gin. They understand about premium malt. They're starting to understand about consumers wanting better drinks. So why shouldn't they want a better drink there in the sky rather than always seeing the same old, same old? So that's provided some opportunity, certainly in some in categories like gin, and I know rum will, and I think malt whiskey too, <coughs> for them to differentiate their offer. Um, when you sit in a plane, you've got a load of magazines in front of you with nice brand pictures. Advertising in that is nothing related to what you see in the menu card. They're, they're operated by different companies, different media companies, and it's expensive. One back page will cost you 10,000 pounds for a month. So if you want to do it, understand it. It's a cost. Uh, ferries and cruise ships. So a couple of examples of uh, the ferry, the cruise ships. And this is, I saw a picture of this ferry, um, an MSC cruise ship, which is really sort of eight stories high, uh, 5,000 people, 8,000 crew. It's a logistics nightmare. How do you get product to each of the ports that the ship will stop at? They want 10, 20 containers of lettuce. They want 20 containers of bread liquor becomes a slightly minor part of their category. However, it depends where you are in the Caribbean. Uh, the American, for the American um, uh, consumer, cruising is a big thing. And so liquor and wines become part of the package they buy. So there's an entry offer, a premium offer, and a super premium offer. So can I get my gin or my whiskey or my vodka into the super premium range and start to work with the bartenders and uh, operate the mixologists on board to create an experience. Certainly some of the bigger companies use crews as a training ground for bartender and they have big bartender competitions. I know Bacardi and Diageo have used uh, the cruise sector a lot for that. Um, the cruise business operates regionally, so you have a lot of ships in the Caribbean and a lot of ships based in Europe. Uh, they do switch over sometimes between the summer and the winter, but as I said, they're going east. So you have a lot of ships being built which will be catering for Chinese-only cruises or Asian-only cruises. Again they will change the passenger mix potentially every seven days. So their range will change every seven days. So supplying that is not something my little company can do. We have to have a specialist to get involved in supplying and getting to the side, getting to the port, and that's a whole industry in terms of supply chain again. Um, there is an, a channel called Other, uh, which some of the people in domestic markets probably don't like because it's sometimes called grey, sometimes called diplomatic, sometimes called mercantile. But it can be, for a small brand owner, a, a, um, a low-hanging fruit in terms of profitability because you sell at a high price. So you're selling to the diplomatic mission or the United Nations uh, shop or the military base in Germany. So if there is conflict, sometimes that's quite good for our industry uh, because there's a few more shops open up in the middle of nowhere where people have got nothing better to do than drink and they can buy buckets of, buckets of liquor uh, within reason. Um, so for us, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. There are borders where uh, also you have shops in no man's land. Some of them are a bit strange, but on the, the b biggest example probably is on the North America, Canadian, US border, and on the South, and the Mexican, uh, US border. There is good business in those stores. They're well operated. The retailers are pretty good. Uh, volumes are small, but you can get, get good, good, good exposure. Uh, there are some borders in Europe uh, on the Danish uh, German border, Czech German border. Germans seem to have an influence or a dislike to go traveling and buying product outside of Germany. Uh, Belgians go into France and Holland at the moment because Belgians are a, a, a high cost liquor economy at the moment. Um, they can be an easy way to get in. So my summary, and then I'll get on, the other guys can give you their, their view, is consider what role this channel can play for your brand. It can be a great advert, but it can also be a, a money grabber. It does represent a huge opportunity. There is a big cake to go after. But understand the basics in terms of how do you get there, the route to market, can your company, does you have the capability to deliver to aircraft in, in secure airside environments, dock sites, uh, duty-free shops all over the planet. Be prepared for a long haul. Uh, you can make quick wins, 
but I started with no business for about 15 months in Halewood. Now we're into a probably a multi-million turnover business in duty free. Yes, a bit of luck. We've got a product gin that works at the moment and gin is the fastest growing category in the channel. I'm very happy, my boss is very happy, but that doesn't leave us sitting on our laurels. There are plenty of other people who can make gin in a few days and chasing us down the runway. Um, celebrate your breakthroughs because they may not happen that often. Uh, so I don't mind showing my boss pictures of airline magazines and uh, we went live in Heathrow with, our, with one of our gins over the week last week and we managed to sell 4,000 bottles in a week. Uh, so scale can happen if you get it right. Um, so if your brand can make a difference, it can be done. These guys have all got brands and experiences, which I know for John and Elwin have got great brands, which have made great strides in duty-free. So I'll let them, you, let them tell you their stories and then we'll do a bit of a question if you might have some questions after that.